Hey everyone, it's Tim Clicks. I'm on the planet to build a better planet. Let's chat Rust. 2023 was a bit of a difficult year for the Rust community. You might have heard people complaining about a draft trademark policy, which turned into this kind of huge uh, melodramatic uh, internet fight, like a cake fight or something. There was a lot of animosity about whether or not this language is going to get overrun by Zig, it might get destroyed by carbon and a whole bunch of other things. But I kind of want to say, you know what? Let's look at the evidence. I'm pretty sure that Rust is going to continue to grow through 2024 and through 2025 and become one of the central pieces of software infrastructure for the next several decades. And it is a solid bet. My name again is Tim. If you want to hit subscribe, that's up to you. If you want to hit reply, that's also perfectly valid because I'm sure that there is a lot of emotions about this particular topic. So, so feel free to comment, find critiques in my argument. And so we're at version 1.75. Rust it has been going uh, pretty heavily since it's Development in, uh, has now been used by companies all over the world, from tiny, tiny things to uh, very large corporations. In fact, the world's largest. It's been growing very rapidly. In fact, the growth has been exponential for multiple years now. Even before 1.0 was released in 2015, by 2020, Stack Overflow was already asking the question, like, why is it that Rust is just so popular? It doesn't make sort of much sense that one particular programming language would be able to dominate its user survey so heavily. So it started out with a blog post and talking about like, what are some of the things that actually really help? And this is a blog post uh, from, from Jake, who I, people in the Rust community will know. The quote that has stuck with me from this blog is that Rust solves pain points that are present in many other languages and provides a solid step forward with just a limited number of downsides. So it's, we're not saying that Rust has no downsides at all, just that in uh, the calculation, the trade-off, it's definitely worth it. And that message that Rust provides a solid step forward has been adopted by many industry players since this blog post was published in 2020 and will continue to become even more true over time. Let's look at the growth of the crates.io registry. So crates.io was a, is the global package manager for the Rust community. And right down here on the left, we have 2015. What we can see is that 2015, 2016, 2017 don't even register because the growth is so massive in daily downloads. During work hours, so the last week, the last working week of 2023, there were 100 million crates downloaded every day. And that growth has been exponential. So this is actually an exponential curve and continues to double. And one thing that I find really interesting is that there is a dip in the Christmas period, uh, all the way through about 2019 as it was first visible and continues to get bigger and bigger and was very big a few weeks ago. And my suspicion is that that represents an increase in the proportion of people that are using Rust at work. The holiday period allows uh, developers at work to close down. And so there's a lot less happening during that holiday period. That's my suspicion that Rust is not just growing, but its adoption in the workplace is also growing. Also, the richness of the actual ecosystem has continued to increase. There are now 35,000 different teams publishing crates on crates.io. So this is you know huge exponential growth that has completely been unaffected by any of the noise or any of the chatter that has been uh, dominating the quote Rust drama world. It's really nice to see that Rust is like these stats actually playing out uh, in people's experience. So there is a comment from uh, Leftmost Cat saying that it's really weird to be finding a Rust stream about the growth of Rust when <laughs> our team is just adopting it. So that's really awesome that that could uh, that could happen. 
I want to point out the subreddit. Now, the Reddit as a platform kind of also had its own weird implosion in 2023 as it turned off the uh, API access. And so there's this big warning banner at the top saying it might be out of date. But the growth curve continues to actually go up. You know, the line continues to go up. And that means you can get a wider number of, uh, of people and the growth of the community is very, very visible. Uh, it's only one data point though, we'll see some extras and um, you can see the effects of the API kind of like ruining the site as the comments have degraded. Um, maybe this data point will uh, decrease in quality over time, but it's something, it's one piece of evidence. Another is the code extensions inside editors. Now there are several of these, but I suppose the most prominent is the Rust Analyzer extension inside Visual Studio Code. This is not enabled by default, so people need to go and install it themselves. And you can see that 2.7 million developers have installed Rust Analyzer on their editor. Does that mean that they are Rust developers? Maybe, maybe not, but at least that they have actually gone to the step of not just downloading Rust, but downloading the extension to support their development. That's a pretty good proxy for the amount of usage that might be uh, used. And when companies say, oh, I, I don't think we could find any Rust developers. The evidence suggests that there are plenty. There are more developers than jobs. At least that's my impression. And developers have a very significant interest in making this happen. But Rust Analyzer isn't the only editor. JetBrains has seen the Rust community grow so rapidly that it's built an entire IDE just for the language. This doesn't happen very often. Uh, in fact, you can see here that um, there might be a quote from uh, someone that you recognize. Uh, this was not a paid endorsement. In fact, I was just invited to try out a demo uh, and, and I stand by this quote. I actually am highly supportive of Get brains and the money they are investing in developers funded to build their editor. The rest of the industry is now taking notice, talking about like what's next for the fastest growing programming language in the world. You can tell by mid 2022 that the C++ community is starting to kind of get a little bit worried. You've got this upstart programming language, Rust, kind of really gaining strength. One of the points in this blog post is that the Rust Foundation has uh, developed a program, which I am actually luckily enough to be one of the participants of this year's grants program. Uh, I'm one of the uh, Rust, Fel a Rust Foundation fellows, I think it's called. There is a very significant amount of excitement building. There was, I suppose, a state at which there was almost a phase where Rust needed to prove its worth. So in 2022, there was a lot of anticipation that Rust would develop something really massive, but it wasn't very well adopted in some critical projects. Over time though, we see more curiosity, like GitHub, Stack Overflow, the general tech publications are all taking notice of Rust. And the question continues to be asked, like, why is it so loved? You know, the quote is here, why is it stealing the hearts and minds of developers around the world? More than 80% of Rust developers would like to use it again, which is actually surprisingly high. It's the most, and it's been consistent for nearly a decade now. Once you become a Rust developer, you want to stay a Rust developer. And in fact, if we look at top languages on GitHub, you can see JavaScript, but if you take a look at the community of Rust, it's actually one of the most inclusive software projects that exists in the programming language space. Rust actually has the broadest number of external contributors to, or as I suppose the broadest number of contributors of any programming language monitored by GitHub. And this is massive. It shows that essentially the core of Rust that is the, its community, its developer ecosystem, is continuing to move forward and bring in new developers, even in the presence of kind of like, head, let's say, this, this horrible term headwinds, which like economists seem to love. You've got this growth of people really wanting to use the language in a very uh, nice kind of way. My hope for Rust is that it produces a new 
wave of software that we can create a new normal, that software can be robust, that it does not need to be brittle. It needs to be in, it can be energy efficient and it can be respectful of both developers in terms of fewer frustrations around packaging or building or distribution, as well as friendlier to users. Users deserve snappy, efficient, responsive applications. Mobile means that batteries and power usage are very, very important. People can use the M2 Max if they want, if they're in a very wealthy country and they can afford to use developer tools or like, you know, the top end of a laptop. Most of the world does not live in the top end. And energy efficiency is extremely important. And being able to ensure that Rust can grow its contributor base is going to be one of its biggest challenges uh, because the one of the downsides is that Rust does tend to kind of burn out people. It is a magnet for people that kind of give a You know, Rust is a, is a magnet for people who are energized. It's a magnet for people who are innovative. And that means that there is a relatively high degree of frustration as well. But again, it's not just contributors that matter. It's actually very large companies that want to invest, let's say, millions of dollars. And one of the most interesting tweets to come out of last year was a tweet from David Weston from Microsoft that Rust is spending about $10 million on being able to support as a first class engineering language inside Microsoft, which includes the adoption of native code inside the Windows kernel. And like, this is not the only small place. Here is a white paper, several thousands of lines of text prose addressing memory safe languages produced by the NSA, and in fact, all of the Five Eyes security intelligence uh, agencies that relate to um, cybersecurity. And interesting thing about this is if you look at its list of memory safe languages, we've got C Sharp, Go, Java, Python, Rust, ding, 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 Swift. The only language in that list, and in fact, that's actually quite a small sample of all programming languages, but let's say that's that's the list. They all come with a trade-off, and that is you need to bolt on to your application an extra runtime. You need to slow down your application while there is a piece on the side that is checking your memory allocations. It's checking all of your pointers. It's freeing memory for you. It's allocating memory. It's called the garbage collector. Rust does not. Of all the languages that have been proposed to uh, take over Rust, like Zig or uh, like say Odin is another really cool systems language. Uh, there are a bunch of other sort of upcoming languages as well. But C++ is the primary, as I said, the predominant language in the, the space. Provides the speed, but not the safety. Rust is the only language that provides both. And that will continue to be the case. And hopefully there'll be some easier to use language. Language designers will be able to create a new language that is even better than Rust. But until that comes, Rust is going to continue to increase its momentum. It's going to feel like 2023 was actually just a blip in the radar compared to the full growth. So we've got, we're getting these messages like Microsoft is spending $10 million. Uh, the NSA even develops um, the recommendations for languages, for memory safe languages of Rust. Rust is the only one that does not impose runtime cost. If you look at a blog post from Android, and in fact, specifically Android 13, the use of memory safe languages was a big uh, consideration for Google. About 1.5 million lines of Rust was introduced. There were zero security vulnerabilities introduced by Google's adoption of Rust. That compares to a historical density of more than one vulnerability per thousand lines of code in their C++ components. So if you are a large software vendor, or even if you're a small software vendor, <laughs> if you have any users at all, and you care about security, and you also care about speed, then you need to consider Rust. You don't necessarily need to adopt it, you might decide to take on the risk of security vulnerabilities and patching and uh, linters and sanitizers and all the rest. You could do that if you want. But now Rust has established itself as part of the ecosystem. It's established itself as a mainstream player. We now have Microsoft, Google, 
the security, <laughs> the, intel the security intelligence community all think looking at Rust. But wait, there's more. Rust is also coming into the Linux kernel. In fact, the first components of it are actually like already happening. And this is like ridiculously important. This now means that Rust is a component in every major operating system that is now being deployed uh, across the world, server side, client side, uh, and in mobile devices, which is kind of ridiculous, really. Furthermore, <laughs> you get the CTO of the Azure group with inside Microsoft, like sending out a grenade saying that C and C++ are now such a threat that they should be considered deprecated. That is a massive statement. Microsoft is a very large company and has many software developers. And this probably, I'm sure, as someone who used to work at a very large company, when something like this happens, the rest of the immune system of the organization kind of like, like re kind of like re responds to it by saying that, whoa, 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 whoa what are you doing? <laughs> Like all of Office, I'm pretty sure, runs on C++. Uh, all of um, other parts of the company, hey, you will use C++, use native code all the way through. Uh, there is lots of native code written at Microsoft, not just C Sharp. The statement that Rust is an equal player, or in fact, above the, the traditional languages, is, um, like, is just incredibly important. Some of the other like internet infrastructure is always is also being like rebuilt or re-implemented in memory safe languages and in particular in Rust. So some friends of mine based in the Netherlands, a comp uh, consultancy uh, called Tweedlegolf, are rebuilding NTP. So when you're so this is the protocol that uh, coordinates time between different computers. And it turns out you're just part of a network of computers and everyone's checking like, what is your time? There are only a few atomic clocks in the world and those clocks sort of set the time. If you want to know more about NTP, by the way, I have actually written a client in my book. Uh, just a quick plug. <laughs> if you want to know more about NTP, we actually build an NTP client from scratch in Rust. And it's really kind of a really cool protocol because it doesn't even use HTTP. It's very low level. It doesn't even use TCP. But wait, there's more. OpenSSL is being replaced by a project called Russell's uh, or Rust TLS. Linux kernel, AV1, which is a, a decoder, which is actually kind of important because user input is inherently dangerous. Sudo, the command for elevating privileges inside Unix, is being ready written. We talked about NTP. Apache HTTP. D, which is the component of the Apache HTTP web server that uh, upgrades connections from HTTP to HTTPS using TLS or transport layer security. It's being rewritten. Uh, we're still sort of solving DNS. Curl now has uh, been integrated with the Hyper library, or at least parts of it, as adopting Hyper, which people in the Rust community will know about. And there's like, there's even more happening uh, through uh, Prosimo, which is again part of uh, a, a non-profit called the Internet Safety Research Group, which also runs Let's Encrypt. But I absolutely love the idea of like promoting Rust as a programming language, and it is going to 100% continue to grow in 2024. Come at me. <laughs> What would you say is the domain of the Rust language? Infrastructure and protocols? Hmm. No. My answer to this question is a bit odd. I think Rust is actually a very general purpose programming language. That is, it started out very narrow. It's People talked about Rust as a systems programming language, just for things like operating systems, device drivers, maybe uh, firmware, you know, stuff that's very, very low level. However, we can see that Rust has grown in the domains that are very, very applicable. There are three that I want to call out specifically. One is command line utilities, or let's say software agents that just live running in the background on your computer. These little appliances, things might be checking, 
some sort of statistic and maybe reporting back uh, to an alerting system, maybe. Or it might be things like grep, or it might just be little developer utilities. These are perfect fits for Rust because they run blindingly fast. But more importantly, they're trivial to install. In fact, they're very trivial, essentially trivial to build and give to people. Here's a, here's a fun story. I spent three quarters of an hour today trying to upgrade Node.js so that I could upgrade npx so that i could upgrade so like to install a utility that was on npm i installed node.js as a version of the javascript runs on the client uh, sorry server side uses the, uh, google's v8 engine its package manager is called npm and then npx is kind of installer on top and all the versions were sort of slightly incompatible it turns out that i had multiple nodes installed this took me like nearly an hour no god please no no i didn't even get the thing installed I eventually decided to just scrap it. And uh, what I wanted to show you was the growth of the visual, the Rust analyzer extension. And there is a node command, which kind of interrogates an API that's provided by Microsoft to provide the metadata for extensions. And it sucked. Now Rust does not do that. Rust is, you can build a binary and give it to somebody. It's as simple as Go, more or less. <laughs> Okay. Go might be a, a, actually a fraction simpler. Uh, Rust will generally require that you enable special toggles to uh, compile one component, which is the interface between your program and the operating system. Normally, this is provided by the operating system. Go implements it for every system that Go supports itself. And so it's all Go code. Uh, whereas Rust will require you to opt in to what is known as static compilation of the term. The, the, the tool is called libc or the C standard library. Uh, it provides all of the interface to Unix. It's essentially the gateway to a Unix operating system. Uh, the other ones are mobile. I think that, that uh, we've already touched upon this a little bit. The mobile ecosystem is still relatively fresh for a new player. I think that there is a lot of opportunity for displacing Java and Rust, it can hook in to Android or to iOS via some of its native functionality. That one's a little bit shakier. That one isn't on such a robust ground, but I think I think the possibility is there. Particularly, uh, but the last one I think is also quite strong, which is Rust for the web, both client side via WebAssembly, you can compile Rust to a low level form that browsers understand, but more significantly actually on the server side. So essentially you create an appliance that sits and listens on HTTP, eats JSON, chews it up and spits JSON back out. Like Rust does that so fast, you might have needed like a 32 gigabyte instance, might take you like, I don't know, 256 megs of RAM. And so suddenly your costs for running this microservice decrease from, I don't know, $20 a day down to 20 cents or less. That I think is another huge benefit for, for Rust. It's not just the memory safety. It's the fact that the build system works. It's a fact that it gives you so much freedom. freedom! Because you don't have to get frustrated with these tiny, tiny details around packaging, around building, around distribution, around deployment. Rust is just so fast. It's just almost unbelievable if you've used something like JavaScript, or I guess Node or Python. I mean, me, I, I was a Python developer for about a decade before Rust, and it still blows me away how slow Python really is. Aren't systems programming languages general purpose? Yes, in some sense though, it's a similar thing to if you try to categorize like a biological species. There are no very definite boundaries between one species and another. These are just useful classifications. In the case of systems programming, it's not even clear what a, what a systems programming language is going to be restricted to. The very first Rust project that was larger than the compiler. In fact, the Rust compiler wasn't even written in Rust at first. It was written in OCaml. So the very first Rust project was the servo web browser. So arguably Rust was never a systems language because I don't think a web browser would fit inside the historical definition of a systems programming thing. It sounds much more like it's in the user space. It's an application level. It's not a file system. It's not a device driver. It's not a 
piece of middleware. It's something much higher level and user facing. And so the taxonomy is always fluid. And I think in Rust, it's especially so. But in the question is like, is there a systems language that is not general purpose? No, there isn't. Uh, you can't lock a programming language down and you cannot lock people's creativity down. But what tends to happen is that programming languages are cultural and groups of people like to hang out together. Something like a Lua would always attract people who want to extend something or embed a little scripting language into something bigger. And so that is the domain. R is a programming language that's excellent, not so much because of the language, but because of the community of statisticians and scientists and researchers that work in R. Python is similar. It's excellent, not because of Python, the language, but Python, the ecosystem, Python, the ability to join together a huge community of data scientists or people that have interested in data analysis. And, and so if something like a systems language will collect, like people will group together. Like if you're a C or C++ person, it's probably likely that you will be pushed out of other domains where say like a traditional systems language would not be as welcoming. It's hard to write a web backend in C. It's possible, sure, uh, it's just tedious. It is very prone and causing like quite difficult things to fix. If we go back to Jake's original quote back in 2020, Jake Golding had this blog post on Stack Overflow saying that Rust solves pain points present in many other languages, providing a solid step forward with a limited number of downsides. And I think that is very true. Rust continues to demonstrate that the combination of Power in terms of performance and reliability and efficiency combined with developer ergonomics. It just it just allows it to be used in like the build system and all of these things that are kind of like the developer experience of using Rust makes it very hard to go back to other programming languages. From that point of view, Rust is especially good at like jumping out of its uh, of its box. Is embedded going to be one of those three areas? It wasn't, but it probably should have been. I have a bunch of hardware devices and I'm going to be creating some more project based videos talking about how to use Rust. In particular, uh, I'm trying to see if I can get my hands on the dev kit from Espressive. Espressive uh, uses the ESP32 uh, little microcontrollers and they have a Rust dev kit. If I can figure out how to order it. <laughs> I will um, get my hands on it and we'll see if we can create some more videos or some tutorials because we've got to shove C out of the way. Uh, not because we dislike C, but just because C was a tool for its time. It is not the pinnacle of software. It does not provide enough protection from things like invalid access or invalid memory access. And so, even if you enter on a system that doesn't have an operating system, you don't have virtual memory. So there's a greater use of um, what Rust calls unsafe. And so maybe that's inherent, but there must be a place for Rust inside the, in the IoT world because IoT devices are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And soon they're gonna be running exploits on uh, all over the place. And I don't want my smart device running C. Like, I really don't. I have not got a smart TV in my house. Not because I don't trust software vendors, but like the state of the software ecosystem is just awful. Vulnerabilities are everywhere. And whenever I see something labeled as smart, I'm just like, I don't want that. Because I know that there is some clunky old version of GCC pumping the old clunky version of Linux that is never going to be patched onto this little device that has open ports with no security. And I'm just like, ah! the state of software is just ridiculously bad given how important it is. Software is the most leverage that any individual has over affecting the whole world. Historically, we used to say that like the pen is mightier than the sword. Let's say you might've like published an essay or something or like a periodical, let's go back to the 19th century you know we're quakers now we want to create a, a revolution and so we'll kind of like we'll publish a booklet well how long does it take a booklet to get published and how expensive is it to publish a booklet well, it's really expensive compared to software 
Software is instantaneous distribution and it is instantaneous like usage. If you get it right, your users do not even need to learn how to use your tool. They're so, uh, they just turn it on and it works. That's what people expect. The problem is that because the industry prioritizes speed and prioritizes cost, it treats users with disrespect. Security holes are everywhere. I mean, today on Hacker News, hacking into an insurance company's website by exploiting a calculator, which they exposed the user's credentials like inside, like just a plain text thing. And I'm just like, what the hell? Like, how is this good enough? Like, how can we build awful, awful, awful software and be paid for it? What does that have to do with it? No, no, he's got a point. I know that people are under stress. It's not really the developer's fault, it's the system's fault. But let's fix the system. Let's create a better default for building software. And is Rust the answer? Mm, it's the best answer we have today. Is it gonna be the best answer in 10 years? Probably not. Like we still want programming languages to be able to expand and we still want growth. It might be that Rust 2.0 is the language that displaces Rust. It might be that some other language of all the options that we have, if you require speed and if you appreciate the developer friendly experience of having things like the build system working. <laughs> Sorry, C++, you really need to fix that. Actually, lots of people have tried to fix builds. <laughs> In fact, there are like many, many attempts. Uh, that's one of the reasons why there's make and CMake and scones and basil. There's um, uh, meson. There's like a lot. This has been a really fun discussion. There'll be more coming down the line. So please, please, please uh, hit that follow button. Hit the subscribe button. Whatever one's there. If there's something flashing at you. <laughs> Do click it because uh, it's it's just absolutely wonderful to participate and uh, see everyone's excitement and enthusiasm. I will uh, wrap up. Take care.